chance, really. I mean, um, I had been written a book about the, the Murdoch scandal, uh, the phone hacking scandal, about two years beforehand. I'd been following the story, thinking maybe I'd update the book. It was called Full House of Murdoch, um, with the evidence in the trial. And I just thought I'd go along for a few days and started tweeting it because, you know, I didn't have to file a report. I occasionally file for Daily Beast, but uh, at that point I was not regularly fire, uh, writing stories for them. And then started getting all these followers. And, and then what happened was the judge, much to my surprise, said you could live tweet the whole thing. And people said, you've got to stay there. And I said, I couldn't afford it. They said, we'll pay and raise the amount of money to keep you there for all eight months for my sins. And they, you know, for walks of life, I just, you know, they're the people who wanted me to provide coverage, detailed coverage of the trial, really for free for other people. So it's a kind of almost like a, you know, telethon for something like PBS in America. They paid me to provide a free service to the public. Well, the benefits of tweeting a trial are that you get the ebb and flow of a uh, trial. What people kind of miss in the amazingly detailed daily reports you get from like Court Reporter and from all the other journalists there, you get a summation of the day. You don't actually get the pace and the, you know, it's like watching a football match sometimes. You don't know what's going to happen. And obviously a report is not as good as a live match. And I think people found uh, that dra dramatic side quite compelling. I certainly had a lot of people saying I kept them away from work or kept them awake a night in Australia and they'd sit back and read my tweets in sequence to find the cross exchange, the sort of banter, a lot of humour, but also the twists and turns of the trial. Oh my goodness, what do you not have to be wary of? We've got to remember the phone hacking trial, I'm just writing a book about it, Beyond Contempt. It was just coming up this section with Dan Evans, who was the News World journalist who was kind of prosecution witness, a super grass if you like. There were over 30 names you couldn't mention by that point in his evidence, which he was going to say live to the jury. Uh, and we would have to redact and come up with code names, you know, use the world senior editor, journalist, whatever. There were code names, Daily Mirror executive or Sunday Mirror executive, where it's to not give away names, which could come up in future trials or investigations. But then you had the additional problem was not to contempt this jury, I to tell them something. They weren't agreed facts. They weren't allowed to be told. The classic one is that appearance of Rebecca Brooks in the DCMS committee in 2003 says she's paid police. Because of parliamentary privilege, that cannot be used in court. Anybody tweeting that, mentioning that, was technically in contempt of court and could go to prison. And so you have to be very, very careful not to tweet out information which the public couldn't hear or the jury couldn't hear. And beyond that, you're not allowed to comment. You're not allowed to say, as GQ did, Michael Wolf article, well, this is a bad defense or a good prosecution or a bad prosecution of good defense. No comment, pure reporting. Every week, Rebecca Brooks's um, barrister, Jonathan Laidlaw QC, would turn up with a ring binder full of prejudicial coverage. A lot of them were tweets as the prosecutor said, scoured from remote places of the internet. A lot of them on my Twitter feed, because I think he was preparing himself for an appeal on the basis that books could not get a fair trial. As it was, she was found not guilty. You know, she got a fair trial. It didn't, all these prejudicial comments about her didn't stop the jury making their own mind out or prejudice them. But that was the big issue. Well, one of my favourites was actually when uh, when Rebecca Brooks was giving evidence. She talked about Dan Evans. She was a a absent for that phase of uh, the Supergrass, which I must write about actually. And and she said, "Oh, I was reading it all on Twitter, you know, about the evidence on Twitter, and nobody looked at me." Uh, and the judge says, "Don't believe everything you read on Twitter." And I tweeted that on Twitter, which was a kind of a mind game. If you know, if it's somebody saying, uh, you know, just says, "Don't believe." everything you read on Twitter and you read it on Twitter. Uh, there are so many highlights. I mean, Dan Evans is one, Rebecca Brooks is one concession, one, if you like, slip in our whole evidence was when she was out charmed by the judge, who was the, she was the second most charming person in the room and Justice Saunders was the most charming person. 
But it, I mean, I, there were, I did what four hundred breaking you know, bits and new bits of news. Um, obviously, the most tense was perhaps the verdicts. Though actually, we had a false alarm uh, uh, the day before, and I'd had this rush of adrenaline, thinking the verdicts were in, they weren't. Do you just want to go home? I think that last phase was one of the last phase where we were waiting around all these journalists like bad school children in the sixth form canteen where the jury was sort of my favourite phrase and you know tweeting that out but um, it was a whole thing it was quite a mega journey well hopefully uh, a sense of immediacy it's because you know they got it first I was seconds ahead Nick Davis even with the affair I think 15 seconds when that was released the course of book affair uh, a detail I mean my aim was to create a database which I have now of over half a million words with all the evidence every little bit time stamped you know all the names sometimes it's quite compressed but I know a lot of people looking at other stories related to this so that's just evidentially an open source database uh, for people I hope they also got a sense of you know an open mind um, I have my opinions about the phone hacking scandal and the corporate responsibilities of News Corp for it. I didn't have any particular judgment about whether these individuals are guilty or not. And I was open to the evidence and I changed my mind at some times. And I was completely fascinated by the court process. So I think though, you know, someone like Louise Minch maybe accused me of being partisan. I wasn't. I changed my mind during it. I think you've got to have an open mind during a trial. And it's great to learn to listen to both sides and not comment. I think court reporting is a very specific thing. We don't allow cameras into our courts, which I think is a good thing. They tend to be very emotional, you know, focus on OJ's gloves or, you know, Oscar Pistorius crying. Um, and so for court reporting interesting cases, I think live tweaking is really good because you get, it's evidential, it's immediate, uh, and you get the detail.